1, Part 2, Part 3, and Part 4. Now look at Part 1. Part 1 A man wants to place an order by telephone for some office stationery. Listen to the conversation between the woman and the man and answer the questions. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Thank you for calling Millennium Office Supplies. If you would like to place an order, please press 1. Your call has been placed in a queue. A customer service operator will be with you shortly. Gina speaking. How can I help you? Oh, hello. I'd like to order some stationery, please. And who am I speaking to? John Carter. Right. Can I just confirm your account number and the name of your company, John? Sure. The account number is 692411. 692411. Right. And you're from Rainbow Computers? Uh, no. The company is Rainbow Communications. Oh, OK. I'll just fix that on the system. Communications. And what would you like to order, John? Uh, envelopes. We need a box of A4, that is, normal size envelopes. White, yellow or manila? Um, we'll have the plain white, please. Uh, but the ones with the little windows. OK. One box, A4, white. Just the one box, was it? Um, on second thoughts, make that two boxes. We go through heaps of envelopes. Um, as a matter of interest, are they made from recycled paper? No, you can't get white recycled paper. The recycled ones are grey, and they're more expensive, actually. Right, we'll stick to white then. Something else, John? Yes, we need some coloured photocopy paper. What colours do you have? We've got purple, light blue, blue, light green, whatever you want, pretty much. There are 500 sheets to the pack. Right, let's see. Um, we're going to need a lot of blue paper for our new price lists, so can you give us ten packs, please? Make sure it's the light blue, though. Ten packs of the light blue. The woman asks the man if he needs anything else. Look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen to their conversation and answer questions 8 to 10. Anything else that we can help you with? Um, uh, let me think. What else do we need? Uh, oh, I'm sure there was something else. Pens, paper clips, fax paper, computer supplies, office furniture. Yeah, ah, oh yes, we need floppy disks. Do you have those nice coloured ones? Yes, but they're a bit more expensive than the black ones. Oh, that's all right. I'm not paying anyway. <laughs> right. Floppy disks. And what about diaries for next year? We've got them in stock already and it's a good idea to order early. Um, no, I think we're all right for diaries. But something we do need is one of those big wall calendars. You know, one that shows the whole year at a glance. Do you stock those? We certainly do. OK, can you include a wall calendar then, uh, with the other stuff? Um, just make sure it's got the whole year on the one side. Sure. And do you have a copy of our new catalogue? No, I don't, but could you send one? Yes, I'll pop one in with the order. You'll find it a lot easier to remember what you need if you have our catalogue in front of you next time. Yes, good idea. And um, when can you deliver this? Should be with you tomorrow morning. 
Can you make sure that it's not after 11.30am? Because I have to go out at 12. There's only myself here on Fridays. Fine. I'll make a note on the delivery docket that they should deliver before half past 11. Thanks very much. Thanks. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear two students talking about a class assignment about wild bird rescue and rehabilitation. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. OK, let's go over the requirements and see what we have left to do. Let's see. We have to give the professor a written summary of the information we've gathered on our topic, wild bird rescue and rehabilitation. The other written thing we have to turn in is a case study of the rehabilitation of one bird. We have the information on that already. Right. All we have to do is write it up. What about charts and graphs? Do we need to include something like that? I don't think so. They aren't really relevant, but we do have to turn in a list of the resources we used. Naturally. What about videos? I heard some of the other students were doing that. Well, I guess that must be optional, because I don't see it on the requirements list. OK, we should start planning our class presentation since that counts for half the grade. We've looked at lots of sources of information, but I think our best source was the interviews we did with the wildlife rehabilitators. Agreed. That and the journal articles. I think we have enough information from those two sources for the presentation anyhow. The books we looked at weren't all that helpful. I wonder if we should try to bring in some live birds for the presentation. That would be too difficult, don't you think? But we have lots of photos of rehabilitated birds. We can show those. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Right. OK, I think we should start by talking about how to rescue a bird. Probably first we should help people understand which birds need rescuing. Yeah, that's really important. Because a lot of times people see a baby bird that's all alone, or they find a bird sitting on the ground and they think it needs to be rescued. And usually, those are just baby birds learning to fly. So we should emphasize that people should only attempt to rescue a bird that's clearly injured. For certain kinds of birds, the rescuer needs to wear protective gloves because some of those birds have sharp claws and can tear your shirt or worse, injure your face or some other part of your body. Yes, that's an important point. OK, next, let's tell people to put the injured bird in a box a box with good air circulation. We should let them know that a cage isn't necessary and a bag, especially a plastic one, could hurt the bird more. Another thing we need to say is that the best way to help the bird stay calm is not by petting it or talking to it, but by leaving it completely alone. Then people should take the bird to the bird rescue center as soon as possible. Right, and we should also point out that when they're driving the bird to the rescue center, it's better not to play music on the radio or talk loudly because those things just stress the bird. 
Yes, it's better just to speak quietly while you have the bird in the car. Okay, we've got that part covered. Next, we should talk about what happens at the rescue center. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between two flatmates, Craig and Don, who are looking for a third person to share their flat. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi, Craig. Been home long? Yeah, quite a time. Did anyone phone about renting the spare room? Yeah, we've had three phone calls about it. Really? Yeah. Do you want to hear about them? Sure. Right. The first one was called Phil Parrott. Uh-huh. He's a teacher. He's just qualified, and he teaches sports. OK. Actually, I'm not sure about him. He certainly sounded energetic, but he asked lots of questions about whether we smoked and what sort of food we cooked. Yeah. I mean, we don't exactly live on pizza and chips and takeaways. Well, not quite, but... But he might be a bit too health-conscious to really fit in with the sort of life we lead. Yeah. And he asked a lot of questions about the room. He said he needs a big room because he's got lots of sports equipment. Well, th that's OK. The room's quite big, but I'm not so sure about him. What about the second one? He was called David Spencer. Spender? No, Spencer. C-E-R. He works at Cooper Long. You know, the big company on Broad Street. He said he was a lawyer. Oh, I'd have thought in that case he'd be earning enough to rent his own place. I wonder why he wants to share a flat. Well, he didn't say. He's quite a bit older than us. He did say he's just moved down here from the north of England. He seemed very quiet, actually. Maybe he wants to meet some new people. I got the impression he was a hard-working kind of person who doesn't go out all that much. Right. But he sounded OK. Oh, one thing, though... He said he wouldn't be staying in the flat at the weekends, so he wants to pay reduced costs for gas and electricity, because he's only here five days out of seven. Oh, I'm not sure about that. What do you think? Well, I suppose it's fair, but it all sounds a bit complicated. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Anyway, there was a third person, Leo Norris. Yes. He's an engineer. Oh, yeah. And he's about our age. Right. What did he sound like? Well, actually, he was really funny. I couldn't stop laughing when I was talking to him. He said he was very lazy and never got up until noon at weekends. And I said that wouldn't be a problem here. <laughs> no, certainly not. But actually, I suspect he was joking when he said he was lazy. I think he lives life as it comes. 
He's certainly not competitive or stressed, but he likes cycling and things like that. He sounds like an outdoor type. Anyway, I thought he sounded as if he'd fit in. He wanted to check if there was somewhere safe for his bicycle. That's not a problem. No, he can leave it in the garage with my car. So did you get his contact details? Yes, he left his mobile number. It's O triple seven six eight seven two four double three. And does he want to move in straight away? Well, he's paid his rent in his present place up to the thirty-first of September, but he said that if possible, he'd like to move in a bit before then. He said the twenty-eighth of September. And he was okay about the rent. Yeah, he said it was fine. Right. So shall we give him a ring and see if he wants to come round? And that is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. Section four. You will hear part of a lecture on art history. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. In the last lectures, we looked at the art of the ancient Egyptians, and then considered the art of other ancient Mediterranean civilizations, in particular Greece and Rome. We're now going to return to Egypt to consider a set of very unusual pictures known as the Fayum portraits. The Fayum is a lush green area about one hundred kilometers west of Cairo. Following the conquest of Egypt by the Greek warrior Alexander the Great in three hundred thirty-two B.C., large numbers of businessmen and officials who had come over from Greece settled in this fertile region with their families. They gradually adopted some features of Egyptian culture, including the practice of mummification. Embalming the bodies of their dead and wrapping them in linen bandages in order to preserve them as mummies, the name actually comes from an Arabic word meaning an embalmed body. These newcomers made one distinctive innovation, though. After binding the mummy, they laid over the face a picture representing the person inside. The portraits look like oil on canvas, but they were actually produced using a technique called encaustic, where the artist applies pigmented wax to a wooden board with a small spatula. The Egyptologist William Petrie, who discovered many of these mummies with their accompanying portraits at the end of the nineteenth century, was convinced that they were actually done in the lifetime of the subject. Rather than being painted after the person's death, as had been the case with older Egyptian paintings, he felt they were very different from the traditional stylized images that had been used on Egyptian mummy casings in previous centuries, and was convinced that they were actually portraits giving a realistic depiction of the person. He pointed out that the boards on which they were painted showed signs of having been cut down to size to fit within the mummy bandages. To him, this suggested that they may have originally been larger and been hung in the houses of the owners during their lifetimes.
but more than a century after they came to light, nobody knew how far they were really depictions of real people, as against idealised portraits. Then a team from Manchester University decided to find out, by recreating the faces of Fayoum mummies in clay and then comparing the reconstructions with the portraits. The team was provided with skulls from two Fayoum mummies from the British Museum and given the information, based on x-rays and other evidence, that one of the mummies was of a fifty-year-old man and the other was a woman in her early twenties. Armed only with this information, they set to work. First, they created copies of the skulls, then they used clay to build up the facial muscles in order to reconstruct what the person looked like. After weeks of painstaking labour, two faces emerged. Only then were the two portraits revealed so that the match between the reconstructions and the portraits could be examined. In the case of the man, both model and portrait showed a broad, flat face with a slightly hooked nose and a fleshy mouth with broad lips. But the man in the portrait was noticeable for his five o'clock shadow, the beard beginning to grow around his chin and on his cheeks. This would have been quite a recognisable feature of the man in real life, and an easy thing for the painter to copy. However, it wasn't something that the makers of the model could know about. In the reconstruction, the right eye was slightly higher than the left, and this was the same on the portrait. But on the portrait, the eyes were very large, which is standard with many of the Fayoum portraits, while in the model they were longer and narrower. The portrait of the woman appeared to be even more of a standard type, with her large eyes, straight nose and small mouth. These pretty feminine features suggested this could be an idealised woman's face, and yet it proved to match the reconstruction surprisingly closely. The proportions of the lower face corresponded, and so did those of the forehead, though in the portrait the eyes were closer together and larger than in the reconstruction. And in both cases the head was set on a solid neck, suggesting a more powerful physique than you might have expected from these delicate features. So, overall, the similarities between the portraits and the models are too close to be accidental. The artists may have started from a standard picture, but attempts were made to modify this to reflect the characteristics of the subject, what gave the face its personal qualities. Obviously, this isn't much of a sample upon which to judge an entire genre of portraiture, but the researchers are convinced that, on the whole, the artists aimed to represent their subjects as they appeared in real life, whether this was flattering to them or not. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.